Hello and welcome. My name is Candace Savage and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation, We All Drink From The Same River. We're offering you a kind of health checkup on the present and future condition of the beautiful, life-giving South Saskatchewan River. This is the first in a series of three Nature City Conversations um, hosted by Wild About Saskatoon that will be unrolling over the next three months. And in a few minutes, it will be my honour to turn things over to our two special guests this evening, Elder Marjorie Bocage and uh, river scientist Tim Jardine. Tansi Egwa Tawau, Candice Savage Nitsigason, Agamaskik Nawagamaganak, Maga Mina, Askilchi Ino Esqueo Omania, Iwichi Hoyo Yana Notch, Wild About Saskatoon. I'm not of Indigenous ancestry, so it's a special honor to speak these few words of Nahea Wewen with deep thanks to my teachers, Charlotte Ross, Sainapan Thunder, and others, people who are devoting their lives to protecting and restoring the strength and vitality of this beautiful spirit-filled language, this river of meaning and song. It's a privilege to live and work in Treaty 6 territory on the traditional lands of the Nehiawak, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakoda, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So we're very happy to welcome you to this gathering tonight, wherever you are joining us from. So I know you all know the drill for these kinds of things. Please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves to one another. And if you have questions or comments for our speakers at any time, please put them in the chat as well. There will be time for questions and discussion after the presentations and Amanda who is working her magic behind the scenes will make sure that the rest of us see them. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers and I'm going to do that in reverse order. They are Marjorie Bocage, who is a two-spirit Métis auntie, filmmaker, archivist and educator a land protector and a water walker. Born, born in Vassar, Manitoba to a large Métis family, Marjorie's life's work has been about creating social change, working to give people the tools for creating possibilities and right relations. She has been a grandmother for walking with our sisters, the elder for out Saskatoon, and the elder in residence for the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. But before we hear from Marjorie, we're going to hear from Dr. Tim Jardine, who is an associate professor in the Toxicology Center and the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan and a fellow of the Canadian Rivers Institute. He studies the ecology of rivers in Northern Australia and Western Brazil, and also leads a large, well, several large collaborative projects in Western Canada's inland river deltas. Tell us more, Tim. Okay, thank you, Candace, for that introduction. And thanks to you and Amanda and uh, Wild Boat Saskatoon for the in invitation and also Elder Bocage for, uh, for sharing this presentation with me. It's, uh, it's a real privilege. So I do have slides that I'm gonna put up and hopefully you can see those now. And so, um, yeah, I'm, when, I, when I was asked to speak here tonight, um, you know, I thought about um, not only the, sort of the, the research that I do uh, associated with the South Saskatchewan River, the Saskatchewan River and other rivers uh, here in Canada, and around the world, but also my relationship with the river, um, because that's important as well for us to think about. And so I ask myself the question, oftentimes we, um, when we think about the health of rivers, we ask whether they're drinkable, fishable, and swimmable. And so 
um, in preparing this, um, this, this presentation, I, I thought about those three uh, sort of characteristics and, and how I would judge um, the, the river um, from that perspective. This is a picture of my dog, Charlie, um, from many, many years ago when he was a young dog, we used to like to, to take him down to the river uh, for a short swim and a drink. Um, he's still, still alive and kicking, but doesn't make it to the, uh, to the river so much uh, anymore. So I'm gonna start with a little quiz. Um, so this is a, for those of you that are watching, you won't be able to provide your answer, but you can think about it. Um, so this is a picture, this was a, an infamous picture that was circulating social media uh, a few years ago um, from the, the Forks, the Saskatchewan River Forks, east of Prince Albert. And it shows the confluence of the South Saskatchewan and North Saskatchewan rivers coming together. And so I want you to look at that picture and think for a moment about which river looks healthier to you, which one looks more natural. So just think about that for a second. Okay, and so your instincts may have told you that the South Saskatchewan actually looks more, uh, more natural. Uh, it's clearer, right? Um, and uh, many people, when this photo was circulating, were arguing that the, uh, the color, um, the visual of the North Saskatchewan was evidence that uh, it was polluted. And so the reality is that this is um, one case where, where our eyes sort of deceive us. And the reason is um, the South Saskatchewan River is, is clear, um, not because it's naturally clear, but because it's unnaturally clear. And the reason it's unnaturally clear is because of um, the settling of sediment uh, into reservoirs um, behind dams uh, throughout the basin. And so this picture I'm showing you here um, shows some numbers on sediment transport. So you, you picture sort of a muddy river. Uh, imagine that mud being carried by that river in a fast current. And what happens is when, when that fast current reaches a reservoir or a lake or the ocean, uh, the, the current slows down. And what happens is the sediment drops out. All that mud falls out to the unsettles on the bottom. And so what happens is through, throughout the world, anytime we've built a dam uh, and made a new reservoir, we've turned a flowing river into a, a lake. And as a result, we have the buildup of sediment uh, behind these, these reservoirs. And what comes out of the dam, the water that flows out of the dam is actually quite clear. Um, so it's unnaturally clear. And that's the case for the South Saskatchewan River because of Lake Diefenbaker uh, and Gardner Dam. And so these numbers, if you look on here, if you can uh, see that, so the circle is the, the average amount of, of uh, mud being carried by the river now. The number in the square is, the, is how much it used to carry, okay? So what we're seeing is about a five times, the river carries about five times less sediment uh, than it used to uh, in the past. We also see this effect further downstream below Tobin Lake as well uh, from E.B. Campbell Dam. We don't have data before the dam was built, but the number is very, very low, unnaturally low. So this is important for water quality because many of the chemicals that we, we worry about actually associate with that sediment, with that mud. And so if the sediment falls into the reservoir, then the chemicals will fall in with it. And so I just want to briefly talk about uh, Lake Diefenbaker uh, because it's a real dominant player well, when we think about both water quality and water quantity uh, in the South Saskatchewan River. And I know you heard already from Bob Halliday uh, about some of the um, so some of the uh, river flow uh, effects uh, over time because of uh, water management. So I won't belabor those points, but only to remind you that um, before Lake Diefenbaker and some of the other dams, we used to have very high flows uh, in the spring and summertime and very, very low flows in the winter. And now that's somewhat reversed. So in other words, we're capturing that water, we're storing it and we're releasing it during the winter in order to generate hydropower. Um, and so as a result, um, this has uh, major implications for the ecology of the system, um, especially in flood dependent ecosystems like the Saskatchewan River Delta, which is further downstream. The other thing that Lake Diefenbaker does in particular, in the summertime, it releases water from the bottom of the reservoir. Okay, and so that's very cold water. So if you've ever dove into a lake in the middle of summer, you'll find that it's really, really cold at the bottom. And so that's because the, the, the warm water sits on top of the cold water in a reservoir. And so the water coming out of Lake Diefenbaker is, is unnaturally cold as well. And so that's what these graphs show. So the, the sort of orange dash line and the red solid line show 
what should be the typical uh, temperature, annual temperature profile uh, for these rivers, for the North Saskatchewan and South Saskatchewan. And then you see this very much lower, these lower numbers uh, for below Gardner Dam. And so that's because of that, that release of that cold water from, uh, from the depths of, of Diefenbaker. And what that does, it affects the biology. In other words, there are certain species now that can't tolerate those cold temperatures. So these are things like insects that live on the bottom of the river. Uh, and you also end up getting some insects that are normally adapted to almost Arctic conditions that are living in the South Saskatchewan River. And so this is a fingerprint that uh, in the, in the, the, what the biology is telling us um, for work out of, uh, from Ian Phillips uh, at the Water Security Agency. So, some, so we call this cold water pollution and it's another uh, effect that's, that's seen uh, uh, in other parts of the world. However, it does make it quite pleasant to go to Cranberry Flats, for example, uh, on a hot summer day and swim in the, in the nice cool uh, clear water that's there, unnaturally cool and clear. So then we can also think about uh, some of the problems of the past and a big one in the past that you may have heard about uh, was mercury. And so mercury is a neurotoxin. Um, it's a global pollutant. Uh, it's natural, but we also sort of enhance um, its numbers and cause, cause human health problems as well as problems for wildlife. There used to be what was called a chloralkali plant uh, here in Saskatoon. So if you go over Chief Mistawasa's bridge, you'll see sort of an industrial facility there. Uh, they were making bleach uh, for the, the pulp and paper mill uh, in Prince Albert. And so that process, the way it used to work, so the, 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 um, it was happening between 1964 and 1978. Um, it involves the use of mercury as the, as the anode, or sorry, the cathode in this reaction to make bleach. And as a result, they were releasing mercury into the river, okay? Um, and as a result, when they tested, people tested fish, so scientists at the U of S back in the day tested fish, the numbers, the mercury numbers in the fish were very, very high compared to other parts of the other, other areas, okay? And so this was very bad news. Um, and it was so bad, in fact, that, um, that they actually found um, a, a mink uh, on campus at the U of S that, was, that had symptoms of, uh, of mercury poisoning. So both in terms of the pathology uh, as well as the, um, the concentrations that they, they observed, because of course mink eat fish. And if fish have high mercury, then the mink will as well. So this, this had implications as far downstream as, as, as the Delta to Cumberland House, where the commercial fishery was closed for three years because of high mercury concentrations. And so yet another example of our actions upstream uh, affecting uh, people downstream. The good news is, Ever since that chloralkali plant was closed, so um, in the sort of late 1970s, the numbers have been dropping. And so th these, these are uh, mercury numbers that you can get from provincial records uh, going back in time for fish caught at Clarkborough Ferry. So this would have been just immediately downstream of that, uh, of that industrial facility. And what you see, this is typical with some of these old sort of legacy pollutants. They, they drop very, very slowly over time, but eventually get there. Okay, so this would be the mercury sort of getting buried in the sediment um, back to where it belongs, sort of in the, in the, the, the depths of the earth, so to speak, um, or being carried away uh, elsewhere to the point now where if you catch a fish in the South Saskatchewan River, that fish is, um, is effectively safe to eat. Um, I'm not sure I would eat, uh, eat fish directly from um, the South Saskatchewan River just downstream from Saskatoon, but uh, certainly further downstream in, in Cumberland House, uh, abs absolutely, and Tobin Lake, etc. So we've also done some other work on other, uh, what are called legacy chemicals. So these are the old chemicals that um, we didn't realize were gonna hang around forever. Uh, they're, they're considered persistent. Um, they accumulate, so they, they increase up the food chain. Uh, and they're also toxic. And so, so these are the ones we, we often have to worry about, even though we're not making them anymore, um, they still tend to show up. And so we've done some work um, in the different reservoirs. So in the, in the headwaters, sort of the upstream end of Lake Diefenbaker, uh, in Cadet Lake, Tobin Lake, as well as uh, Cumberland Lake uh, down in the Delta. And so we look in the, in the mud. So again, because a lot of these chemicals associate with that mud, um, that's where we're most likely to find them. 
And so when we did that, uh, what we found were detectable concentrations, okay, so of these dioxins and furans. So these are some of the nasty ones. Um, there's this long list here of all the different types of chemicals, different little structures. Um, the worst one is 2378TCDD, this very top one, which doesn't show up uh, very much, which is good. Some of the other ones are in there. They often, they're, they're highest uh, in the really sort of high clay. So think of like potter's clay, that really fine stuff. It has a, a, it's able to bind lots of chemicals. So that's where you'll find it the most. We don't exactly know where these chemicals are coming from. Um, for a while, we thought maybe they were associated with the pulp and paper mill in Prince Albert, um, because that's, that's, pulp and paper mills are known to produce dioxins and furans. Um, but the, the types of chemicals that are in there don't necessarily match up with that. So we think it's mostly just sort of an atmospheric deposition, a background um, um, concentration. The good news again is that in all cases, even though we're detecting them, we have very sensitive instruments. And so we can pick up things at very, very low concentrations. And in this case, they're below the, the sort of quality guidelines established by the federal government, for example, to protect things that live in the, in the sediment. We also looked for those same chemicals uh, in fish um, because, you know, people eat fish. We want to make sure that those, those fish are safe to eat. And in this case, those concentrations were well below um, some quality guidelines for the protection of wildlife and also below um, the concentrations that we would be concerned about for human consumption. So we tested a whole bunch of suckers and a few uh, pickerel and, and jackfish and found that, um, that the numbers were not, um, not of concern. So again, you know, I'd happily eat fish, uh, with, with these, um, with these numbers, even though again, it'll, it's always a little bit concerning to know that these, these chemicals are, are in food. We also looked for some pesticides. So, um, you know, we're here in the southern prairies, we're surrounded by agriculture, and so obviously we might expect to see uh, pesticides showing up uh, in the river. And so when we looked at those numbers, um, we found that a lot of these common use herbicides, so things like 2,4-D uh, and dicamba, um, are detectable in water. Um, so they show up in the water, but again, they're well below uh, guidelines set, set by uh, the federal government um, that, that sort of take a, an effect level and then divide that by 10 or 100. So these are considered very safe levels, um, of course, from sort of a, you know, that sort of Western uh, perspective, right? Um, we also looked in the, in the, in the mud again, um, and we found actually surprisingly some uh, old uh, pesticides. So uh, a lot of these organochlorines, so things that are related to chemicals like DDT, which, uh, which you're probably familiar with. And so those are still showing up uh, in the sediments, again, at very low uh, concentrations below these sort of uh, quality guidelines for the protection of aquatic life. But they're out there and they would be, you would detect them in pretty much any river system uh, that you looked in around the world. And so we also looked in the fish as well for those same pesticides. And what you'll notice if you compare these uh, different slides, the herbicides um, show up in the water, but they don't necessarily show up in the sediment and they don't necessarily show up in the fish, okay? The, the current use herbicides. Um, and that, the reason for that is the, these current use herbicides tend to break down fairly quickly uh, in the environment. Okay, and so part of the reason why, so we're surrounded by agriculture, so you would think there's got to be these pesticides, insecticides, herbicides coming in uh, from the surrounding farm fields. Part of the reason why we think that the numbers are fairly low in the river itself is that a lot of the farm field, the water on the farm fields never actually reaches the river. Uh, there may be some, a bit of groundwater connection, but not a surface water connection. And so this is a, a phenomenon that's called non-contributing area. So in other words, if you're out in a farm field here, you're technically in the basin, in the Saskatchewan River Basin, but all the water, all the snow that melts on, your, on that farm field just flows into a little slough, uh, a little pothole wetland on your, on your farm. And so if we're gonna look for harm to invertebrates and um, wildlife, for example, it's most likely to be happening in those in those sloughs because they're kind of bearing the brunt um, of, of a lot of the, the chemical loading that we that we put on the landscape. 
they do the hard job of, of uh, sort of storing and transforming those chemicals uh, and, and uh, cleaning up the water effectively. And so that's why our wetlands are extremely important uh, to us. So that's a little bit about the, the, the South Saskatchewan River. And, and before um, I finish up here, I just want to remind everyone, we can't forget about the Delta. Uh, and so this is the 10,000 square kilometer Saskatchewan River Delta, also known as the Cumberland Delta. Um, it's a very special place, uh, extremely diverse and productive for wildlife, important for livelihoods and culture for people, um, but it's under threat. So all of the bad things that we do upstream uh, in the basin come home to roost in the Delta. Um, so if we put chemicals in the river, they're probably going to end up in the Delta. If we change the water flows, it's going to affect the Delta. If we stop the sediment like we're doing uh, with all of our reservoirs, the Delta doesn't have enough sediment uh, for it to, uh, to continue to connect to wetlands and build channels and, and do the, all, all the magnificent functions that, um, that Deltas do. And so the Delta is in trouble. And I want to particularly point out my friend and colleague, Gary Carrier, who died uh, this month. Uh, we lost a good man and a man who fought um, for a long time for the Delta. Um, some of you may have had the privilege to meet Gary or heard him speak uh, passionately about his, his homeland. Um, his death is a huge loss um, to the community, to uh, researchers like me, uh, and anyone that, uh, that cares about this Delta. So I, I couldn't present tonight without, uh, without mentioning uh, the Delta, which is it's the Saskatchewan River after the North Saskatchewan joins, but it's still very much a part of, of everything we do uh, here in Saskatoon. So my main takeaways then, South Saskatchewan River is unnaturally clear and cool. And so that's good in some ways and bad in others. It's good because it means nice conditions for us. The water looks good, looks clean. It's nice to swim in, uh, easier to treat for drinking water. Um, means the fish, you know, are, are pretty healthy. Um, but it's bad because a lot of that sediment, that important sediment, uh, is being trapped in, in, uh, in Lake Ethan Baker. And so um, I would argue that the South Saskatchewan River is drinkable, fishable, and swimmable from my perspective. Um, and that's a surprise given, you know, when you look around at the, uh, how much agriculture there is uh, in the basin. Mercury was a problem, but not, not so much anymore. Um, and we're still picking up a lot of these legacy chemicals in the sediments. But for the most part, we don't see them in fish. Um, they're low, the numbers are low relative to some other industrialized rivers uh, around the, the, the world. So I would argue um, when it comes to this river, the issues around the quantity of water and the seasonal flows, uh, as well as the, the sediment transport problems are the bigger issues um, that, that we need to think about. Uh, and those are ones that we don't necessarily see um, affect us in our daily lives but they're having huge effects on, on people downstream uh, in the Delta. So I'll just leave it there and, and remind us all that, you know, you're here obviously because you care about the river. And so you probably don't need me to tell you that. Um, but this is a, the, the river is a huge um, part of this city. The fabric of the city is part of the reason, a huge reason why I love this city uh, is, is having the river here. Uh, and so it's a part of my life and will continue to be. And, and uh, so we'll always do our best to, to look after it. And thank you for listening. Well, <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but it's, uh, it's very uh, wide opening. Anyway, gre greetings from Duck Lake, where I live, the Métis homeland. Um, I have some water from a river, uh, from this year's water walk. Uh, I've been um, walking for the river for three years now, and <clears throat> we have one more year, one more leg to go north to finish uh, th this round. The, the water walk is uh, a ceremony. Um, it comes, from the Medewin tradition in the Ojibwe uh, uh, worldview. And I was inspired by uh, Josephine Mandeman, who has been walking for the waters for 17 years before she passed away in 2016. She uh, walked all the Great Lakes twice, 
one body of water every summer and the rivers down east and down south like the Mississippi and the St. Lawrence and many, many rivers in those 17 years to help the water because our, our waters are in danger and water is our first mother and it's water is life. We've seen that uh, people protecting the water everywhere with that with that mantra because it's true it's not just a slogan and and uh, for me that that uh, water is life it's governed by grandmother moon all the waters of life whether it's the rivers the oceans the tides our tears uh, our blood it's all governed by grandmother moon which is shining bright tonight, the wolf moon, uh, and has its own rhythms and its own laws. And those laws are, are not respected by the dominant societies in the world. They don't understand our relations to the water. The, the water is our responsibility as women especially to take care of and to make sure that it's clean and healthy and always uh, taken care of. And when I hear that the dams govern the water, then the water can't govern itself, you know? And if that water can't govern itself and everything is changed because some human machine is governing the water, then things will not be right. The, the walking uh, the last three years across this Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, has shown me how much trouble we're in because the water is like only three feet deep. Like as long as the rivers flow, that was the treaty. <laughs> but that water is not going to flow for long. The sun is burning, you know, the grass is brown and the water is not swiftly flowing like the name says. Uh, it's been a drought for three years and it hasn't rained on us the whole, all the times in the summer when we were walking and and there was the heat was like unbearable on some days because we had to start walking at four in the morning three in the morning to to be able to walk every day and carry that water and help that water flow so it's very scary that that these the climate change that's going on affecting the water the way it is and then humans uh, seeing the water as a resource so that they can just take it when they want and 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 irrigate to water fields that are are not even food like it's for our cattle <laughs> and and uh, golf courses <laughs> and and uh, and then to see the recreation areas like in Riverton that have been made off of that and Baker Lake just to uh, create that playground and and uh, and just assume that that's okay that it's okay to just take from that river and not give anything back and not care about about how we're using it and and what what it's doing and I remember going on that river last summer and and the captain of the prairie lily boat that does tours there for over 14 years said like the we were zigzagging across the river because because he couldn't find the channels deep enough for the boat like the boat requires four feet of water so like there was too, so many sandbars and everything that that we couldn't he couldn't even navigate straight down that river anymore and and the changes in in the animals and uh, beavers and and waterfowl and everything uh, 
along that river has, has changed drastically because the levels have gone right down. And even the St. Laurent Ferry where I live, uh, like where you see the sandbars and everything, he said the, the dam controls the flow of the river right across the Saskatchewan River. And, and so they control it for their use for hydro, which is water, liquid water that we have in our house every day that gives us light. We have, you know, we all drink from the same river. Like I was thinking, like you turn on your top, you flush that toilet, you wash your clothes, you wash, you know, all from that river, but it's not going to last forever if we don't take care of it and take care of how much water we use and <clears throat> what we put into that river. Those statistics, you know, those charts, like that's only one part of the way to see the river. It, it's, uh, I don't know, it, when I'm walking and carrying that water, when we pick up that water and we carry that water, each step is a prayer to keep that water flowing and to restore its health. And it's it's like when uh, it's a ceremony that is in each step. Each step is a prayer, and and uh, we've done that for many things in our communities forever. Like going on pilgrimage, walking for what needs our attention, for what needs our care, whether it's suicide prevention or. Uh, missing and murdered women or all of those uh, things that people have walked for, it's, it's because our prayers are putting our body and walking with intention changes things. That is, that is what we know. That is part of the way that we live on this land and as caretakers of this land and the water and everything, all our relatives that are on that water and on that land, we we know that we are part of it and it's part of us and we can we interchange our energy with each other to help each other. We haven't been very good caretakers of the earth and of the waters. We we've uh, neglected a lot of our responsibilities and um, it's it's why we're picking it up. And uh, this year, we, we're going north, which is going to be a hard trek, harder than the other ones, because we're in the forest and, you know, trying to follow the, the as close as we can to the river for that energy. But we, we carry the water from the river, so that river is always with us, even if we're not close to it. And, and uh, but as we walk through through the north, we won't have like campgrounds. There's a lot of, there'll be a, at least a week where there's no campgrounds or facilities of any kind. And uh, there'll be like bears and, you know, other animals to encounter and insects and black flies and mosquitoes, all those things. So we need to feel safe. Most of the walkers have been women and two spirit. And uh, so we need to feel safe when, when we're walking and when we're resting at night. So uh, we're trying to raise money or ask people, and I'm asking you and your friends, if you have a motorhome <laughs> or RV of any kind that, that you want to uh, lend us for the month of August or a week or two in August and that get us through that part of the, our journey that would really be helpful or to send money so we could maybe rent some or uh, have some shelter for the for those days that uh, we'll, we'll need so it's uh, this is not a uh, a nonprofit or anything like that. We're just people that care about the water that walk and, and we provide raise money through our own means and um, just make it happen. And there's been a, the Unitarian congregation has been a big part of 
uh, supporting the the water walk and uh, from the beginning, and uh, we're we're going to do it one more time, whichever way we can. I mean, it's going to happen uh, with whatever we have, and and hopefully we'll get through it uh, safely and uh, with uh, your support. Um, what else do I have to say? That's, I don't know, maybe I'll wait for your questions. I'm, I'm not that good at just talking <laughs> without knowing what you need to know. But, but we do all drink from the same river and I want you to consider that when you use the water and say thank you. It's been proven that our thoughts and our energy are powerful and we can change the water. We can change the, our relationship to it. That's why we sing to it. That's why we we focus our, our attention on it. When you're walking, you don't think about anything else except the water and what's around in that moment. So it's a good way to stay present and to stay in relation and in, in that moment to what's around you. and. It's been a real gift and blessing to be able to do that. And I'm grateful for for my health and for the ability to, to be able to do it again this year. I'll pass it back to Candice. Thank you both for chastening and, and thought provoking um, commentaries. Amanda, do we have any questions or comments from people? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, we do. Um, Vince Natomagan from Pine House is asking about the Churchill River and whether that river is vulnerable to a similar fate as the South Saskatchewan. Hmm. Is that something you would like to address maybe, Tim? Sure, so so the Churchill is a bit different in, this, in a few ways. Um, one is that um, it doesn't have necessarily have water coming off the Rocky Mountains, right? That uh, the Albertans get their hands on first uh, before it comes to, to us. So that's one way it's different. Uh, another way it's different is it naturally has many lakes. As, you know, if you anyone who's spent time on the Churchill knows many, many lakes. Um, and so that's gonna change sort of how chemicals move through the system. Um, Generally speaking, the Churchill is also clearer water, naturally clear uh, water, probably because of those um, because of those lakes. Um, so I would say certainly there would be local effects um, of things like uranium mines, for example, that I would certainly be be concerned about. Um, there are a few dams further down in the system, um, but for the most part, it's um, more free flowing than the than the South Saskatchewan River. So I would say. But I guess equally vulnerable. Um, you know, if you if you develop um, a certain area, then you're you're likely to have effects. I think that's as a society, we have to acknowledge that. Um, so, you know, people who support industry, um, you know, often tr try and push that to the side and think, oh, this is a you know, you know, this will create jobs, um, and we don't need to think about the consequences. So, I think any industrial development is likely to to have negative effects. And um, Vince has another question, which intersects with a question that I have too. His question is, notwithstanding theoretical legality considerations, is there a way to hold all vectors or sectors or agents, I guess, accountable so that everyone has equal access to clean water? And that intersects with the question about how do we make decisions about water? I, you know, um, it's very difficult often, it seems to have frank discussions with people at the Water Security Agency about big questions. They're not obvious. We've just lost um, 
the partners for the Saskatchewan River Basin um, because of lack of funding. Oh, how do we? Okay, so Vince's question is, how, how is there a way to hold users, actors accountable so that everyone has access to clean water? Mm. Is that right defended somewhere? And that everyone includes the fish and the insects, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. We know what the Saskatchewan government thinks about the duty to consult. <laughs> they send a fax and they give you a week to reply, that type of thing. That's happened so many times with the, even with the ir irrigation. I mean, how much communication do we have? We can't get information. We can't, we can't be participants in our own uh, decision-making about the lands and the waters. Like they, they have absolutely no relationship to indigenous people and disregard uh, treaty and rights and all of those things. So it's like, how do, how do we hold our governments accountable who are making these laws that even without consultation on everything? That's one thing that we have to change. Yeah, I agree. I, and then there, you know, I can't really speak to this. I have lots of colleagues that study governance uh, in, in the basin, right, and, and think about these things a lot and, and know a lot more than I do. But I agree with uh, Elder Bocage that, you know, the duty to consult process is flawed, um, certainly as written and definitely as practiced uh, here in Saskatchewan. The other sort of factor is that a lot of the, um, a lot of these legacy issues arose from a time when there was even less consultation or zero consultation. I mean, the dams, when the dams were built, you know, E.B. Campbell Dam was built with no consultation to, to Cumberland House, right? And you talk to people who are associated with that dam now, and they will tell you that that dam would never be built the way it is today. All so, dams. I mean, I remember the Churchill River diversion when the Manitoba Hydro mm -hmm. built the dam up north and, and flooded communities out lakes across like like all the people who depended on fishing for their livelihood were no longer able to fish because they changed the water level so much mm -hmm. that the f lakes were almost dry and it was the same like when i walked through outlook last summer i could have walked on the floor of the saskatchewan river there was no water in it because they were working on that irrigation project like they, they, they changed the water levels just like that. So they were not working on the big irrigation project, the, the irrigation expansion project, the mega project, but there were all kinds of the little, the more, more small straws being put into the river on, with private projects and yeah, yeah under permits. It's even been though going on for a don't. while and nobody knows yeah. about it. Yeah. So are you suggesting that it's up to us to to um, observe what's going on around us and be a voice for these places and realities and relatives that can't speak for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Minimum. Yeah. So I learned a little bit this winter about the way that the flow of the South Saskatchewan River is governed. Um, and I've forgotten the year, but there is quite a long time ago now, it just celebrated a famous anniversary, like 40 years or 50 years, an agreement called the Master Agreement on Apportionment, which um, through which Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba dis decided on how much of the water each jurisdiction is um, entitled to. And so Alberta can take half of the natural flow and Saskatchewan can keep half of what it receives and the rest must flow on to, um, to Manitoba. But there's no, there's no credible basis for um, even acknowledging the river as an entity in all that, a, ri a river as a place where life exists, you know, as an ecology um, of its own, 
there, you know, some theoretical kind of run of the river um, minimum, but nothing that has to do with maintaining temperature and flow regimes. There's none of that has been um, provided for at all. So it's, you know, I, I've been wanting to ask both of you, um, you know, if we were going to set things right, how could we ever do this? It just, it feels like we're so far down this road of ignoring the river as a river. All I could say to that is that um, given enough time, I would like to think that nature will heal uh, and the river will heal itself. But you're right, the pro we have to stop the problems first um, before that healing occurs. Um, one thing that people talk about in the Delta, um, so the Delta was, you know, this wildlife hub and, and part, you know, big part of the fur trade. People had this strong relationship with the, with the land and water for so many years. Um, and livelihoods. And livelihoods. Uh, and it took, you know, it took about 50 or 60 years. So it's been about 50 or 60 years since the dams were built upstream. Um, and that's been a steady and slow decline in the Delta. Um, but the thinking there is if it took 50 years for it to decline, maybe in 50 years, if we turn it around, it can, it can come back to its former, um, former glory. But so others, others argue that you can never get it back. Uh, and that's kind of sad. Mm. Well, you got to think about everything as connected and related to like clear cutting is cutting off the water as well. Like there's so many, like the, everything is, is connected and, and we're so used to just taking taking whatever we need and not giving anything back or putting things, balancing things out. And so like when you take away the forest, you're taking away the water as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in like, and the wild rice lakes and all the other things that are like the wetlands, everything. Uh, so, so it's not just a river or it's not just one body of water, it's like, a relational network of life that that's all connected and as until we understand that uh it's not going to change it's like people live very much you know in uh with in the moment and what they and the corporates and companies you know their profit and their bottom line is what they go by and and they take you know, they don't think about the future and what the, our children and grandchildren will have. You have to have long-term thinking. You have to have relationship with your world around you and know, know it, like not just see it as something that you can enjoy or take from. Like it's a worldview. It's a value-based thing. And, and it's listening to what, indigenous knowledge keepers and elders are saying uh, the ones who know the land intimately and that's our first teacher Vince had another question um, which is will the expansion speaking of taking from the river will the expansion of Lake Diefenbaker I think what he probably is referring to is the irrigation expansion, further exacerbate the sediment problem and reduced water levels. So, what, so not everyone may know that the provincial, when, when Lake Diefenbaker was built, was the, when the dams were installed, the plan was for a very large area to be irrigated and those um, targets were never met. And so now there is a revived plan that will greatly increase the area, um, the amount of water withdrawn for irrigation. And so Vince's question is, what would be, what are the, this is a proposal right now in, in some kind of strange limbo, but what would the, what would, are the, would be the consequences of that development for the river and for the Delta? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Marjorie's already spoken to, you know, what she sees on the ground, right, for um, for water withdrawals associated with irrigation. And there is no question 
that there will be less water in the summer uh, after this irrigation project happens because much of the water that's withdrawn for irrigation goes onto the field. Some of it evaporates, a lot of it ends up in the crops, and very little comes back to the river. So that's the difference between irrigation and some other water uses, like city water uses, for example. We take the, you know, water comes into our homes from the river, but it goes back out as well. It might not be as clean as, it, as when it came in, but it goes back out. Whereas irrigation, a lot of that water is gone. So no question, after irrigation expansion, there will be less water in the summer for the river and for the delta. When it comes to the sediment question, that's an interesting one. One of the ironies uh, about the sediment problem is that the irrigators on Lake Diefenbaker are actually having problems because there's too much sediment building up oh, uh, yeah. at the top end of Lake, Lake Diefenbaker. So the that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, so sed sediment that used to make it, its way all the way to the delta and form the delta is now trapped in Lake Diefenbaker and it's getting in the way of, of those uh, those irrigation operations. And so it may come to a point where they have to actually dredge um, dredge Lake Diefenbaker. And we've started that conversation uh, about this uh, an idea of sediment restoration for the Delta, if you could somehow dig it up from Diefenbaker and move it to the Delta, which is a drastic and costly solution. It's multi million, you know, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, but it's something- The river would have done it for free, the river, right? The river, the river <laughs> did it for free. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And what would be in that sediment now? Well, exactly. So this is the uh, that's part of the reason why we were testing uh, the sediment in those reservoirs was a first look to see, you know, if you were to put that sediment back in the river, um, would it pose any risk um, to, to fish and wildlife? So you were also giving us information about individual contaminants in the sediments, but there were dozens of chemicals you were mm -hmm. showing us. So if you have small levels of, you know, 20 different yes. toxins, can you really assess the safety? Yeah, so that, that's absolutely a concern. And so there are ways, if the chemicals all kind of act in the same way, like these dioxins do, then we can simply add them up and then account for them that way. Um, the problem happens when you have different kinds of chemicals that act in different ways. It's, it's like when you, you know, don't take these two drugs together, right? Yeah. They, might, they might have some bad reaction. It's the same thing with a lot of these these chemicals. If you don't really know necessarily if they're going to cause more harm than you'd expect just based on one plus one, right? So Vince has said, thank you for the answers. Perhaps the Prince Albert Grand Council, FSIN and Métis Nation of Saskatchewan and other interested parties should champion a province-wide water conference that the government can't ignore. Yes. <laughs> no, let's do it. Yes. yes. Always support that. <laughs> um, there's a question for you, Tim. Is there a place where people can look up more information on the sediments and the contaminations um, that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we certainly, I mean, we publish that, that work uh, in, you know, very technical uh, academic journals. And so it doesn't make for great reading. Um, not really meant for non-specialists, but um, I would argue that, you know, uh, partners for the Saskatchewan River Basin probably would have been, or Wild About Saskatoon, or probably, you know, probably the organizations that would produce that, the kind of material that would be, that would summarize mm -hmm. a lot of those academic findings. So that's maybe a conversation we can have about um, putting together a two-page summary um, that, that could go out to the public, be happy to do that. Sure. Yeah. All right, so we all have jobs, Vince. <laughs> I'm big on to-do lists. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is an, another question. Um, I believe this is for you as well, Tim. Was data from the transboundary water quality monitoring used? I believe there's about 50 years worth of sampling at all streams that cross into the province by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Yes, That's so way over my head. So yeah, so so I don't have that data myself. Um, I could probably get it if if I uh, asked for it. I was looking at some of the summary documents just today um, in thinking about this question. And so, um, for example, there's a station on the South Saskatchewan at, at the at the border, um, just downstream from Medicine Hat. And so that's a place where. Um, as part of the master agreement on proportion uh, apportionment that you alluded to, Candace, there is a water quality component to that as well. Um, and that would be the closest thing 
uh, that they the closest they get to sort of accounting for the life in the river, right? Uh, beyond just the the minimum flows. And when you look at those those um, those data, they, the the provinces the Prairie Provinces Water Board, who's responsible for that, they they basically say things look pretty good. Um, I would argue, you know, they're they're comparing to pretty high sort of thresholds. So in other words, it's very easy for them to stay under those the, the bad numbers, right? Um, so I think there's may, maybe some questions about what what numbers they should be using. For example, they set. Uh, the nitrate value, so that's the, the nitrogen often associated with, with farming um, fertilizer runoff, as three milligrams per liter. And so that's a very pretty high number. Um, mm. So they say as long as we're under three milligrams per liter, we're, everything's good. Um, but I think, you know, stuff probably happens at, uh, at numbers just below three, for example. Stuff. Is, is, is like people using Roundup and all those things, like especially the canola fields that they spray and everything, like wouldn't that, the, is that monitored at all? Um, no, well, so again, the concerns that, that I would have about those chemicals would be in the wetlands on the farm mm -hmm. fields. And, and we do, in fact, I was just showing my third year class some numbers for uh, neonicotinoids, which are these known sort of, you know, problems for bees and, and other insects. There's a certain type of neonicotinoid that we've actually, la last summer, when we looked at our numbers, they were extraordinarily high uh, in a lot of these, these wetlands. But if you look for those same chemicals in the river itself, you wouldn't find them. So mm -hmm. they're, they're mostly just uh, on the fields and, mm -hmm. you know, in the groundwater and in the sloughs. So bad, a bad thing, but not necessarily for the river itself. So we have, we're in this situation of having a river that's exotic, that's um, vulnerable because the water comes to us from so far away, mm -hmm. but paradoxically it's protected yes. for that same reason. So mm -hmm. we have we have this wonderful gift of pure mountain water mm -hmm. that we well th that we should be looking after. It looks more to us like pure mountain water because in its as you were telling us in its natural state it should be. Um, didn't they used to say? Um, too thick to drink and too thin to plow. Yeah. That's what a prairie river is supposed to look like, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Marjorie, if people want to support your the ceremony, the walk, can they send you money? Where do they send you money? We well, the, we do have a, a Saskatchewan River Walk website or on Facebook, but the Unitarian Congregation accepts our donations. So if you want to get a tax receipt, you you make it to the Unitarians and and uh, and then you put a note on your check or your email or e transfer for the water walk. Okay. So they've been the doing that. Uh, financial piece for for the walk. Okay, and I think there is a slide Amanda had. A, a, maybe we could put it up again. I don't remember exactly what the. Yeah, there was. I wrote. I wrote it down. It's got the email address on there. Yes, yeah. she's oh, gonna put it in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Okay, brilliant. So, Mar Marjorie, what uh, what do you know yet? What river you're walking this this lake? It's called the Saskatchewan River. The word walk starting. We did the North Saskatchewan the first year, mm -hmm. from uh, the headwaters to uh, the forks, mm -hmm. and then the last two years we did the South Saskatchewan, starting you know just where the at the Bow Valley, mm -hmm. where the river starts there, and and we're back to the forks. So now the two rivers are joined up. And now we're going north to, to through the Paw to Grand Rapids, where the river wow. empties into the Lake uh, Winnipeg. Wow! So you'll be going through Cumberland House. Uh, don't know because from we can't go backwards on our walk like to right. follow the river, and we can't walk from Cumberland House to the Paw. Mm -hmm. or, you know, so we 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 have to chart our route as close as we can, but we might not be going. Well, we could go there and end, but then we'd have to start up again at uh, right. another uh, place on the river to go through the Paw. I think we'll be going through the Nippewin, like uh, Tobin, like, like along mm -hmm. that route, the Tote Road to the Paw. And do you welcome visitors when you're like to to come say hello as you're walking? Uh, <laughs> 
when we're in camp, <laughs> it's easier to visit. But when we're on the walk, we're in ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to, uh, yeah, you can come and, and walk for the day and, and be part of the walk or support in different walk along with us and things like that. But it's, it's, uh, it's hard to keep the energy flowing when you have people who don't really understand what's going on. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we have to take the time to educate people and then that takes energy away from the walk. So it's better after when we stop for breaks or at camp mm -hmm. to have visitors if they just want to visit. Uh, if they want to walk with us, then to walk with us. Right. One thing I've noticed over the years working in big rivers uh, with deltas is that roads often end in deltas. So, my, yes. so Cumberland House is another example of that, where you can go in, but you can't keep going. Yeah, that's yeah. maybe someone. Maybe someone will lend you a hovercraft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if that would work, but yeah. <laughs> Well, we could, we could talk about important things for the rest of the night, but the, the bag of questions in from, from the group has now been emptied, um, except for some comments for you, Marjorie. Kay says, go Elder Marjorie, go. <laughs> <laughs> and Megan Nolan says, we all love and appreciate you and thank you for all you do for the water. And perhaps we'll just end with a, a comment from Winona Wheeler, who um, thanked you both for the synergies between the Western and Indigenous knowledge and the approaches that you've brought to this discussion. Um, she says she learned a lot. I learned a lot. I'm very grateful to you both. Mm -hmm. Can I? Uh, suggest uh, singing for the water. Oh, that would be water. lovely. That would be beautiful. Yeah. It's just a simple song that came from the water walk and, and uh, we sing it all the time for the water as we walk. For water, we love you, we thank you, we respect you. I'm putting that energy in, in the water. Hebe. Giza Geiko Gili Gwecha Wene Riko Giza Wene Riko Hey, hey. Mm -hmm. Thank you.